Welcome to Module 3, where we will review Appendices D and F of the Nova Scotia Standards of Practice for Non-Sterile Compounding. Upon completion of this module, you will be able to define and understand the importance of standard operating procedures, explain how policies and procedures reduce the risk of medication errors in the dispensary, and also describe the requirements set out for the designated compounding area as well as compounding equipment. Policies and procedures are required for all activities and equipment related to compounding. The compounding supervisor is responsible for ensuring these policies and procedures are developed, implemented, and adhered to. Procedures standardize the processes or steps involved in completing a certain task. They minimize the chance for error and reduce the risk of medication incidents. In other words, they protect the public from the potential risks that are associated with compounding. When all staff follow the same policies and procedures, you can be assured that the end product for the patient will remain safe and consistent. Policies and procedures need to be reviewed at a minimum every three years or upon a change in practice or standards or after a quality related event. Consider your own pharmacy. Can you confirm that each staff member would prepare a compound in the same way, always using the same steps? Probably not. A list of policy and procedure topics, as well as a template to create standard operating procedures can be found in Appendix D. These are the minimum requirements and include policies and procedures for personnel, facilities, and compounded preparations. I won't review them all, but I will review a few examples of topics that need to have standard operating procedures. The first is dress code, hygiene, and garbing. Think about what clothing is appropriate for compounding. Should a designated lab coat be worn? Does the compounder require gloves for all compounds? How about proper hand hygiene before and after preparing a compound? Personally, I think N95 masks, gloves, and a compounding lab coat should be the minimum requirement for most compounds we make in community pharmacy. There should be policies and procedures around expected behavior in the compounding area. For example, no eating or drinking in that area. Only one compound should be prepared at a time. And the compounder must remain focused on their task. So no socializing in the compounding area. The compounder should not be expected to multitask and answer phones or respond to patients at the counter when they are in the middle of preparing a compound. Another important topic is cleaning. The compounding area and equipment must be cleaned and sanitized on a regular basis to ensure the quality of compounded products. Do you know how often the scale is cleaned in your pharmacy? Is it done after every compound? There needs to be a procedure to follow, which may include approved cleaning products, a cleaning schedule, and required documentation. Before developing cleaning policies and procedures, the compounding supervisor should review manufacturer guidance for their equipment, as well as Appendix F of the standards that has a section dedicated to cleaning requirements. Every piece of equipment used for compounding requires a standard operating procedure. This acts as a how-to guide for all staff to consistently follow. There should be a standardized process to follow during compound verification to ensure public safety and minimize errors. What steps can you put in place in your pharmacy to make the verification process the same, no matter which pharmacist or pharmacy technician is dispensing? Another example is recall procedures. When there is a Health Canada recall, how will you identify affected compounds and notify patients when required? Although it may seem like the creation of policies and procedures is a daunting task, they don't always need to be complicated. They can range from simple statements to more complex documents. For example, a policy and procedure for wearing PPE for compounding can be as simple as saying, all employees preparing compounds must adhere to the PPE requirements described in the MFR but at a minimum must wear nitro gloves, an N95 mask, and a dedicated lab coat. 
Or, on the other hand, there may be a detailed two-page document describing the order of garbing required for preparing hazardous compounds. It really all depends on the nature of the compounding practice. I want to include a real-world example that highlights the importance of standardization of procedures when compounding. This case involves a four-month-old baby who developed encephalopathy, seizures, and respiratory compromise as a result of baclofen toxicity. The baby was prescribed compounded omeprazole suspension, but when it was prepared in a retail pharmacy, it was mixed with baclofen powder instead of sodium bicarb powder. The normal procedure for preparing omeprazole suspension involves using injectable sodium bicarb, but at the time of this error, there was a national shortage of the injectable product. So the pharmacy used sodium bicarb powder instead. Baclofen powder and the sodium bicarb powder were located side by side on the pharmacy shelf and the pharmacist compounding the suspension picked the wrong product. The baby ended up receiving a 480 milligram dose of baclofen, which is approximately 160 times the dose recommended for spasticity in a four month old. The child was then admitted to hospital with baclofen toxicity. How could this error have been prevented? In Nova Scotia, with the standards of practice in place, a new master formulation record would need to be made outlining a new procedure to follow if an ingredient in a preparation changed due to a drug shortage. An independent double check of ingredients and quantities should also be required and documented before the preparation is mixed. I'm really unsure of all the circumstances surrounding this error, but if there was a robust standardized procedure in place, it is possible that this error could have been avoided. I think in this scenario, it would have also been important to consider if the compound was still appropriate to make since an ingredient was unavailable. As we reviewed in module two, Appendix A outlines important considerations when determining if it is necessary and appropriate to prepare a compound. One would need to consider if there is another suitable alternative product. For example, are commercially available Nexium granules available in an appropriate dose? Or is it possible to step down therapy to ranitidine or famotidine suspension, which don't require sodium bicarb injection? Thankfully, in this case, the infant recovered with supportive care. But we all know that outcome could have been very different. Compounding must occur in a designated compounding area of the pharmacy. The area used for non-hazardous compounds can also be used for other pharmacy-related activities, such as packaging compliance packs, as long as compounding is not occurring at the same time. The compounding area must be big enough to allow for the safe and proper preparation of compounds, storage of material and equipment, and must be equipped with the necessary controls. Surfaces in the compounding area must be able to withstand repeated cleaning. They should be smooth, free of cracks, and non-shedding. Floors cannot be carpeted as they need to be easily cleaned. You wouldn't want carpet in your kitchen, so you shouldn't want carpet in your compounding area. Think of the possible mess, stains, and accumulation of drug powder or residue. Before compounding a product, an evaluation of the compounding practice and environment must be completed to determine whether the complexity of the compound requires a separate room, specialized equipment, or special training, and also to determine what risk mitigation strategies are required for safety. The result of this evaluation determines the environment in which a product must be compounded. A separate room may be necessary and these requirements should be included in the master formulation record. In terms of facilities, there are different requirements for non-hazardous compounds compared to hazardous compounds. Non-hazardous compounding must be done in an area of the pharmacy that is away from foot traffic and ideally away from any HVAC vents to avoid interference with ingredients. 
You don't want air shooting out of a vent above the compounding area, causing powder to be blown all over the pharmacy. The area must be large enough for staff to work comfortably with minimum interruptions. So you wouldn't want the compounding area right next to another workstation where the compounder may get distracted or fumble ingredients due to lack of space. There must also be enough room for equipment and ingredients to be placed in an orderly manner to avoid spills and cross-contamination. There must be a sink, water supply, and eye wash station in or near the compounding area. There must also be a spill kit available and maintained in a manner that allows spills to be promptly and safely managed. Hazardous compounds should generally be prepared in a separate area used only for this compounding and require a hood and room that is under negative pressure. The compounding supervisor must consider a number of factors when deciding if a pharmacy is equipped to compound with hazardous medication. For example, compounding hazardous medication may not always require a room under negative pressure and hood. If a product is made in small, infrequent quantities, the compounding supervisor may decide that it is appropriate to prepare this compound with proper PPE and other mitigation strategies in place. It was already mentioned that all equipment used for compounding needs standard operating procedures. They also need to be stored, cleaned, and maintained to ensure proper functioning. Maintaining equipment properly may involve calibration on a set schedule to ensure accuracy of measurements. For example, an electronic scale is a piece of equipment likely used in all pharmacies for compounding. But I bet many pharmacists could not tell you the last time their scale was calibrated. Each pharmacy should have a set of calibration weights to calibrate their scale on a schedule deemed appropriate by the compounding supervisor or that is recommended by the scale manufacturer. Records documenting maintenance of equipment, such as cleaning or calibrating logs, must be kept for a minimum of two years. I want to share another real world example. In 2012, a compounding center in the United States manufactured three lots of contaminated, preservative-free methylprednisolone acetate injections. This resulted in 793 patients developing fungal infections, including meningitis, of which 64 patients died. This enormous error resulted from pharmacy staff not following formulation worksheets or standard operating procedures. In particular, sterilization procedures and verification were not completed properly. Employees were aware that product was shipped to patients before sterility was confirmed, cleaning logs were forged, and mold and bacteria were found inside the compounding area. This case resulted in two pharmacists being charged with 25 acts of second degree murder and 12 others, including pharmacists, technicians, and district managers being charged with multiple other criminal acts. This is an extreme example, but it highlights the importance of not only following the standards of practice, but also site specific policies and standard operating procedures. Skipping steps and taking shortcuts could result in irreparable harm. This concludes module three, so you should have a better understanding of how a compounding area must be set up, and also an understanding of the importance of developing policies and standard operating procedures for all aspects of compounding. We need these in order to standardize processes and reduce the risk of errors.